I think campaigns are, there are three types of campaigns. Campaigns that are based on personality, campaigns that are based on issues, and campaigns um, that are tribal, I would say. And what I mean with this, uh, there are campaigns based on personalities. Um, I know um, Barack Obama, not to mention Albanian names. I know Barack Obama, I've been in school with him. I like him, I like the way he talks. I like the way he acts. That's why I'm gonna vote for him. So the whole campaign is based on the personality of the guy who's running. And that's the first type of campaign. The second type of campaign is based on issues. Basically, uh, I care about the environment um, and one candidate or one party speaks about the environment. So since I care about the issue that they're speaking, I would vote for them. The third type is tribal. Uh, I'm a socialist. Uh, I'll always vote socialist. Whoever runs for mayor, if he's the socialist mayor candidate, I'll vote for him. I'm a Democrat on the right wing. I always vote right wing. Whoever is the candidate, I'll vote for him. Now in Albania, um, what we found out from all the surveys that we've done, here it's very tribal. So basically if you take a look at all the surveys, what you find out is that normally you have 35% of the people voting left, 35% of the people voting right. Um, normally it should be 30 in the center, but it's never 30 in the center. Um, usually it's around 10. And what happens if you take a look at the surveys is that from year to year, you might have the right gaining a little bit more or the left gaining a little bit more. If you take a look at 2005, there were around 45% of the people who would identify themselves on the right, around 40% of the people identifying themselves on the left, and the rest in the center. If you take a look at 2013, there were around 48% of the people that identified themselves on the left, or 35 that identified themselves on the right, and the rest in the middle. So basically you have a middle that is floating, and that's the one that in the end decides who wins and who loses, if and when elections are normal, because then we also have the other, the other issues. But let's, let's forget that for the moment. Um, but what I'm saying is that um, whatever happens, um, and we can take a look at the worst moments the Democratic Party or the Socialist Party has faced, whatever happens, each of the parties is able to get around 30% of the vote. What does this tell us? It tells us that at any given moment, you have 30% of the people who vote on the left and 30% of the people who vote on the right. And since Albania is a very tribal country, people who vote on the left would vote on the left no matter who's the candidate on the left. And people who vote on the right would always vote for the candidate no matter who he is, if he's a candidate of the right. Um, around the world, um, it's not like that. Tribal is less, and number one reason for voting is personality. Um, then is issues, and then is tribal. Here it's tribal, then personality, then it's issue. The interesting thing is that if you talk to most of the politicians, um, they'll tell you that the most important thing are the issues. Whether we talk about the environment, um, the economy, um, law and order, justice, unemployment or employment and everything else. But when you take a look at their campaigns, you realize that the least important things are the issues. Why? Because the most important things are tribal and personality. You vote for somebody because he's rep representing your party. You vote for somebody because um, he represents your city. You vote for somebody because he represents, in some cases, your religion. Then you vote for somebody because you like him, you like him more, or you like him less. 
And only then you vote for somebody because they're talking the, the right things or the things that, that, that you want to hear. It's said. Uh, usually it's not being said, but you know, I like to say it because it's, it's the truth. Um, I'd just like to, to uh, have a very quick question. Um, and don't get me wrong, and be absolutely free to, to, to express your views. Uh, how many of you would vote, uh, would, let's not say vote, would consider themselves on the right wing? Can you raise the hand? OK. And how many on the left? OK, now the question is, how many from you on the right think that, or know, that also your parents are on the right? And how many of you on the left think that your parents are on the left? It usually happens. In Albania, the tendency is the same. So if I'm on the left, most probably also my parents are on the left. Also my family is on the left. And if I'm on the right, most probably also my parents and my family are on the right. That's why in Albania it's very tribal. So people belong to the left or to the, li or, or to the right. They would tend to vote for the candidates on the left or on the right. And their families would tend to have the tendency to, to, to do the same. So the question was not to know how many of you are on the left or on the right, but actually I wanted to know if it's stable within the family or not. And, and it clearly is. Um, so as I told you, there are three types of campaigns, issue-based, personality-based, tribal-based. Now, whenever we campaign, um, the most important thing is the message, what we say. The second most important thing is the messenger who says it. And the third most important thing is the channel that we choose to communicate. Now, having the right message is not enough. Um, for instance, if my message today for the elections in Tirana would be uh, putting um, families and elderly people first, the messenger is also important because if I take um, a young person who speaks about the elderly, he or she might have the perfect message, but the messenger is not good enough. And then the channel is also very important because you might have the right messenger who says the right message. So you have, um, I don't know, um, um, a singer who's in the 60s who represents perfectly the elderly. Uh, she has the right message, but she goes and says it on uh, top select, which is mainly a program watched by young people. So you have the right message, you have the right messenger, but you're not talking to the audience that you want to talk. Why? Because the channel is not the right one. So always try and have the right message, the right messenger, and the right um, channel. Um, during these days, and especially now that I drove from, from Tirana to here, there's all this um, debate about paraphernalia. You know, you have flags hanging all around the places. You have billboards, you have city lights, um, you have ads on TV running against and in favor, negative ads, positive ads, focusing on the bios of the candidates, focusing on the reasons why not to vote for the other candidate, and so on. And this is part of the campaign. Um, but it's interesting because um, some of these things are necessary. I mean, all of these things are necessary, but some are crucial. Some are not. For instance, um, I would say that having a good ad 
on television is very important. Um, but the messaging of that ad should be consistent with the message that the candidates or the parties would give whenever they talk to the people, whenever they rally, whenever they participate in, in, in anything that they do. If the messages are not consistent, then it doesn't serve well. Because people get confused. Um, it's, it's amazing um, how sometimes the campaign have this idea that you know, the candidate should be perfect. So you have a candidate who's old, uh, who's gray, who's a little bit fat. And you see him every day, the candidate, uh, in all the rallies. You know, he's fat, he's old, he's gray, he talks slowly, doesn't have energy. And then you watch an ad. And in the ad, all is redone. He looks slim, he looks nice, he looks energetic, but it's not him. And what happens is that people get confused because they see somebody on TV in the ad who's young, energetic, nice, slim, and then see somebody else when they watch the news on television who's not the same guy. It's somebody who's totally, totally different. So you should always be careful um, when doing this type of things. I mean, of course, now technology gives you the option to improve things, but don't change reality that much because otherwise it will be really difficult and becomes uh, counterproductive. The other thing, for instance, is this whole issue of the, of the flags. We, for instance, had to order flags from China. And the shipment took quite a long, a pretty long time. And we just got the flags last week. And there was all this fuss about why the others have flags and we don't have flags and what happened to our flags. Without flags, we're going to lose elections. We're going to lose votes. The truth is that flags are not important. I mean, somebody would not vote because he sees a flag or doesn't see a flag. I mean, that's, let's be serious on this. But what's important is that flags and, you know, hats and t-shirts and all this kind of stuff are very important for the volunteers of the campaign. So if you're volunteering or if you're a member and you see that your opponent has signs and has flags and has everything hanging in the streets and you don't, you perceive it as a weakness. So you say, he has it, why don't I have it? The truth is that it won't change anything. In the, in the end of the day, I mean, people won't vote for the flags. But you know, sometimes you also have to spend resources and money and uh, uh, efforts to do things that are important for your own base. So always keep in mind that you know, not only the opponent is important, not only the public is important, but also your base, they also have to be energized and they also have to be motivated uh, to work because otherwise it won't work. Um, usually when we do the campaign, we operate um, uh, a concept that I call the seven boxes, uh, where each of the boxes um, would have somebody that would cover an area um, of, like, let's say, a function. Um, on top of the seven boxes is the campaign manager. Um, he's the one who coordinates between all the people in the staff. He's the one who keeps the relations between the candidate and the staff um, that, that does the campaign. So the campaign manager is, is very important. Although he's the type of person who should stay in office, should coordinate the staff, keep everybody happy, know what the priorities are, know what the message is, know what the, the strategy is, and so on and so forth. Uh, then you have the seven boxes. Uh, box number one would be scheduling. Um, there are three important resources for each campaign. One is time, the other one is money, and the other one is people. Um, 
what you can do is that you can get more money or less money, you can get more people or less people, but what you can't buy and you can't control is time. So you need somebody who focuses on just one thing, scheduling. And what does that mean? It means that what should the day of the candidate look like? So let's say if I'm the candidate uh, and I have 30 days to do a campaign, um, what should I do during the day? There are some things that I absolutely need to do. For instance, I need to attend rallies. I need to meet with the party structures. Um, I need to do media interviews. I need to meet with the press uh, off record to talk about issues. I need to do fundraising because in the end of the day, everything has a cost and you need to, to raise money on that. So all of this uh, should be left in the hands of somebody who manages time. He's the scheduler. He's also the one who decides where the candidate goes. Um, if the candidate is running for prime minister, he will have to go all around the country. But who decides how many times he goes to Tirana and how many times he goes to Duras and how many times he goes to Schroder? It's a scheduling person. What he does is he gets together with the people who do the research, they, they see the data, they divide the cities or the areas into areas where we will most certainly win, in areas that we will cer most certainly lose, and into areas that are, you know, up for grabs. So what you usually do is you usually don't go a lot to areas that you've always lost and that surveys show that you'll lose again. You go a little bit to areas where you're absolutely sure that you're winning. Uh, although you're winning, you, you still need to go there because it's like the, the issue of the, of the flags. You need to energize your, your base. And then you focus a lot on those areas that, you know, the result is undecided. So you need to campaign really hard there. So this is the job of the, of the scheduler. Usually the scheduler is the one, is the first person that gets fired because that's one of the most tough jobs. And usually the candidate, yeah. Can I sure. No, it, usually it, it should happen like that. I mean, what, what happens is that even if you take a look at Tirana, I mean, you don't have the candidates who go uh, in all regions within Tirana with the same fre frequency. Uh, so what usually happens is that it changes a lot. Uh, if the scheduler is a good one, uh, what he or she should do is have the top priorities for the candidate and then have other people who would campaign on behalf of the candidate. So you'd never leave the, the, the region empty or an area empty, but what you'll do is that you'd have the candidate focus a lot on the top priority areas and then have other MPs, uh, people running for the municipal council, um, uh, party people who would uh, campaign in the areas that are not as important and not as, I mean, important not in, in the sense of electoral importance. So this would be the, the good division. Usually, if you have a good scheduler, the, a good scheduler will make sure that the candidate would go everywhere at least once. He, would, he or she would focus a lot on the most important areas, but none of the areas would be left empty. So he would put uh, somebody else campaigning everywhere then not a very good scheduler would either send the candidate to a place where there are 40 voters all together and send him there uh, three times, four times, five times, and it's useless. Or you'd have 
again, a bad scheduler who would send the candidate into the important areas, but leave everything else empty. And that's not good, because in the end, you might end up losing also places that you thought you'd be winning. Sure, but uh, what we usually um, have learned is that the moment um, uh, we get the perception that people are fed up hearing the same message or, um, uh, or with visits of the same person, that's the moment when the audience has just started to notice a thing. So what happens is that uh, People who are involved in the campaign uh, are surrounded by people who are very interested into politics. Uh, so all they do is they talk about politics. They watch television a lot, watch news a lot, watch the public debates a lot. They go on the internet and follow what the candidates have done. So on some of this, um, it might be true. They usually get bored. But this is not true for the larger public. You know, there's, there's a wrong perception. The perception is that those who are undecided are those who are the most intellectual. That's not true. Those who are the most intellectual are not undecided. Those who are, those who are undecided are usually those who are most disinterested and less informed about what's going on. And that's, that's a case study. Nothing. The, the other thing is, is true. If, if you're somebody who is a lot focused, you might not be interested in politics, but if you read a lot, if you watch a lot of, of TV about politics, if you follow politics a lot, chances that you're undecided are very narrow. Usually those who are undecided are people who are totally disconnected with, with, with politics. And during the campaign, it's exactly these people that, that you target. So what happens is that it's, you know, it's a bit like, like, a, like, a, like an ad of you know, Coca-Cola. I mean, there's, there's a reason why you'd have Coca-Cola have the same ad that would go on for weeks. Same one. It's the power of repetition. Why don't people say, come on, Coca-Cola, produce another ad? because we're bored with this one. People who say this are those people who are into marketing. But the average people, they don't follow television as, as much as, as, as we do. So the rule of thumb is that the moment that people start, that you have the impression that people are getting bored with your message or with your presence, that's the moment that people are actually starting to think that you're there. I mean, this is, this is a huge debate. For instance, in, in the elections in the US, you had this debate about Barack Obama and about Hillary Clinton and about everybody else. The candidates in the States, they have what they call a stump speech. Basically, it's the same speech that gets repeated every day. If you're a journalist, you go to an event, you know what, what the candidate is going to talk. You know it. But he's talking to different audiences on a daily basis. Some people start asking and say, look, but you have the same quote uh, getting there and people watching TV and watching Obama saying the same thing every day. People don't watch TV every day. I mean, we're talking about the average people. And then it's also good to be identified with something. I mean. Obama's message was change, and everybody knew it. Now, you don't have exactly to say, to, to say the same words. So wording does not have to, say, to, to, to be the same. But actually, the message, that has to be the same. That has to be consistent. For instance, one of the 
I'll, I'll get there. One of the, according to me, the main mistakes done by our opponents right now is that in the middle of the campaign, they changed the slogan. From uh, work and dignity, they moved to uh, work and no words. I mean, that's a mistake. Why? Because the first two weeks, all the resources that you spent, airtime, billboards, city lights, messaging, debates, everything, all gone. And you have to be sure about what your message will be before you start the campaign, because then it's, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, well, um, there, there are a couple of issues. Again, there, there are two ways of seeing this. Um, if you would talk, to, if you would open the TV and watch the, the debates, if you talk to most of the journalists and these opinion leaders that you have on a daily basis on the TV. I mean, they, they portray Albania as a, as a mess, you know. People that are getting ripped off because they're made to pay energy. Uh, this government that is getting down illegal buildings and people have invested their own life into these buildings and now they're completely losing them. We actually do, do a poll and, and take a survey. Uh, you realize that the most successful things that um, people uh, believe this government has done are number one, energy, number two, illegal buildings, number three, this closing of uh, private universities that uh, are not serving well. Uh, and number four is Lazarat, the, the intervention of, of the police. And when we talk about these four things, it's incredible. Um, the percentage of people who support these actions are around 85 to 87%. And it's not important the percentage per se. But what's important is that if you have 35% of the people who would vote for the Democratic Party and you have 85% of the people that support the energy action, what it means is that even people who vote for the Democratic Party end up supporting... Uh, uh, here it's not uh, that much uh, tribal. Because tribal would be, again, uh, when it comes to the vote, what would have been, and, and this, is, this, is, this is interesting. For instance, you have people uh, who think the country is going to the right direction, who think Eddie Rama is, going, is doing a good job, who support um, the energy uh, action, who support illegal buildings getting torn down. But again, if you ask them who you're going to vote for, they would say I'd vote for the Democratic Party. Why? Because it's tribal. But the very fact that all these things that have been done by the government have a good reputation also in people who would vote for the Democratic Party in local elections is an advantage. And I think our other good advantage is also the concept of the idea, of the model. Um, and this is something that, that we say quite often. And I don't want to get misinterpreted by those who like the opposition. But for instance, one of the things that we say pretty often is, uh, who can tell us a single model of a city being managed by the Democratic Party that is a success story? A single one. And it's hard to, to, to find one, you know? I mean, there's, there are a lot of debates, uh, but for instance, I've been to Korcha, and Korcha is, is a nice city. Um, uh, right now, during these last two years, there have been a lot of investments 
in the, in the city centers. Again, very far from what they need to be, but again, it's, it's started. But same question is for Tirana. I mean, we're right now, we're having an ad, uh, I don't know if you've seen it, of somebody who asks a group of people and says, who can name a single thing that has been done by the current mayor in four years? Hard to find. Again, when, when you talk about campaigns and when you talk about messaging, it's important not to lie. For instance, if I told you what a beautiful weather today in Tirana, um, and it was such horrible weather in Saranda. Now, none of you knows what's the weather like in Saranda right now. But chances are that you'd believe me and say, oh my God, why is it so bad weather in, in Saranda? But if I were to tell you what a thunderstorm this morning in Tirana, it was so beautiful in Saranda, you'd say, wait, I mean, the weather in Tirana is, is fine, he's lying. Chances are he's also lying about weather in, in Saranda. So the most important thing is when you do the ads, I mean, don't think that people who are watching the ads are uh, people who are there to buy anything that you say. It's not true. You need at least to start for something that is true. So for instance, if the Democratic Party would run today an ad that would be the same, where you'd have the same voice asking the same people saying, who can tell me at least one thing that the government has done in Albania in the last two years? And you'd have exactly the same people doing, I don't know. This wouldn't be a good ad. Because people, they might have a lot of debates whether the energy thing was good or bad, whether taking down illegal buildings were good or bad, whether uh, there should have been a lot more focus on the economy or employment, but you cannot say that nothing has been done. So you always need to, to, to have the starting point that needs to be something that is true and fair, up, at least up to a, to a certain degree. You cannot bullshit, pardon my saying, people, uh, I mean, cannot be done. Um, because we're going from uh, the second box. <laughs> the second box is press. That person that takes care of media. Television, radio, and nowadays a lot of social media. Um, it's incredible what internet is doing. If um, radio killed the newspapers and television killed radio, now we're living in the years where internet is killing television. Um, it's amazing. Um, in 2013, we had an ad. Um, we put it on Facebook. It was called the logout option. And what we did was we said, we want everybody in Albania during the last three days of the campaign, whoever logs out of their account of Facebook, they would have the ad in front of them. You pay almost nothing compared to what you spend on television. And you know clear data. You know how many people saw it, how many people clicked on it, um, how many people were from Tirana, how many were from different cities, age groups, and everything. Um, it's a very big debate with, that I have with my um, colleagues. Because whenever you have one of these small newspapers that would come up with a front page that would be, you know, against us, there would be all this fuss, why he did this, uh, uh, how do we react on this, and so on and so forth. And the only question that I ask is, look, uh, this newspaper has a circulation of 2,500 copies. If four people would read the same copy, it would be 10,000 people in total. Now think about our Facebook page. Eddie Rama's Facebook page has around a million. Now let's say half of them don't live in Albania, but half do. 
So compare if you put something on Facebook, what's the coverage that it gets with something that is written on a newspaper. Now for us that have been living with the newspapers, newspapers are still important, but the importance of Facebook and internet, it's, it's amazing. Third box is um, ads. Uh, you need, sorry. Now we haven't we haven't done any any study to um, for me to be able to to give you the the exact answer. Um, I think that in 2013, uh, social it was the first time that social media was used as heavily as we did uh, in a political campaign. Uh, many things were done wrongly, uh, but it was the first time. Um, you know, to me, the most important thing was that on, on, on that campaign, on social media, we focused a lot on interacting with the people rather than numbers. So there were two, two separate campaigns. Our opponents were investing a lot on having more likes, more supporters on the fan page, as it, it was a, a race who had most people uh, like their page on, on Facebook. We did not enter that, that, that race. To us, it was important to put their messages that would create interaction with, with the people. And I think that's, that's what, what, was, what was important. Um, this race, um, you know, this race is a little bit different because being, having local elections, the campaign is, is, is very much, I mean, each city and each candidate has its, its own approach. I mean, based on the bigger strategy, but it's hard to control the whole campaign in, every, in each and every city because, you know, it's, it's local elections. So, it's not over. I, I don't know what, what's the best answer right now. But last campaign, I think it was, it was the effort to, I mean, the main advantage was the fact that we believed in social media. We put a lot of information there. Um, and we played a lot with uh, applications on Facebook that were able to make people interact rather than just, you know, go for likes or for likes on a post or likes on a page, um, according to me. What I loved was also this, this thing that we did, but I don't think many people um, know about it. We did this during the bus, we had a bus and we did a bus tour. And um, within the bus tour, we were streaming live, uh, we were streaming live press conferences of the prime minister in the bus with the journalists, and while we were moving in the bus, everything was broadcasted live on the internet, and then the TV stations would take it from there. And it was it was something nice. But we, yeah, I mean, we put a lot of a lot of videos uh, online, and we were able to integrate lots of volunteers into a platform that was made to share as much as they could information on Facebook. So not just, I mean, the, the main mistake that people do is that uh, you have a press release, you put it on Facebook, you put it on the website. Doesn't work. I mean, you need to, to be very interactive. I mean, if, if people were interested in, in reading a press release, they would do it on the website, they would do it on the Facebook, they would just read it and that's it. The key is to, to have interaction between you and the people. And that, that's what Facebook does really good. Um, but, but to me, the most important thing is the notion of social media. Because I remember when, when the prime minister opened the, the time he was leader of opposition, when he opened the Twitter account and the Facebook account, 
uh, everybody, the, the, those in government at that time, the media, they were all saying, look, what's he doing? He's only tweeting. What is this Twitter? What is this Facebook? What about the media? This is not serious. This is stupid. Uh, the prime minister at that time was calling him TOTO all the time. And then it ended up that, you know, they did the same. It's just that it was a matter of, of time to understand that, you know, it wasn't a new channel of communications and, and you cannot ignore it. So the third box is the, the, the ads. So you basically have things that you might mostly be interested in, uh, marketing. Um, this would be the people who would produce advertisements on ra radio, television. Radio is very important. Um, radio is very cheap and is very important because people, especially while driving, they would listen to the radio. And while we don't know if people are in front of television, if they are watching television or they're not, if they're just listening to the program or actually watching it, most probably people who are driving, um, they're listening to the, to the radio. So although um, usually radio doesn't look that important, especially in, in political marketing, but I'm sure also in, in standard marketing, radio would be, would be important. And now, of course, online media, YouTube, and everything is important. But the good, the, the good thing to do, and the most important thing to do, is to integrate everything. So same message that you put on television, put it on radio, put it on YouTube, put it on Facebook, put it on Twitter, put it on um, uh, Flickr, uh, what's this, uh, Instagram, uh, everywhere you can. So basically you, you make sure that people, wherever they go, they would see a consistent message and, and that you're them. Um, fourth box um, would be uh, political, uh, meaning the persons that make sure that there's a good coordination between the candidate and the campaign and the party. Because you can have a very nice campaign that looks very nicely on TV, but then you need the party to get out the people to vote and um, to get out that 30% that is your secure uh, number of votes that, that, that you'd get. Usually this is a person who belongs to the party and does the liaisoning between the campaign and the party. It's important to have the people of the campaign be people that are not necessarily linked to the party. Uh, I always say in these cases it's better to have people from the outside who are professionals, who get paid. If they commit a mistake, they, they can be fired. Um, because otherwise you end up getting lots of volunteers that you're not uh, paying and that uh, you cannot ask them um, to work properly because in the end of the day they would say, he would say, you know, I'm just a volunteer um, and you cannot ask things properly to these people. Um, fifth box would be the volunteers. Um, the volunteers um, are all the people who do the door-to-door -door campaign, are all the young activists who would be on social media and distribute your messages. There are all the people who would go and, uh, you know, distribute leaflets, um, uh, hang posters, uh, and all this kind of stuff. Um, the volunteers are really important for the Get Out the Vote campaign. Um, we have a program that uh, we have all the people listed in our database who are people who are likely to vote for us. And what the volunteers would do is, during the whole campaign, they would go and knock on the doors and make sure that the list that we have correspond to the reality. Um, so if Andrew is in our list a person who's uh, a party member who lives in this street, you would have volunteers who would knock on the door and make sure that Andrew is still living in that place. He's still voting. He's still um, uh, living in Tirana. Uh, and he's still happy with the party because you might have cases where he said, uh, I wanted to get a job, you did not give me a job, so I'll switch parties and I'll go with another party. Um, and then on, on election day, you'd have different types of softwares uh, to, to understand 
um, how many of these people have voted and those who haven't, you would probably get the volunteers to make phone calls, send SMSs, emails and everything else to remind these people to get out and vote. So this was the fifth box. Box number six is um, events. Um, these are the people who in marketing would be the, how you call it, below the line uh, uh, marketing. This would be the people who would do the events. This would be the people who would make sure there's a stage, there's a banner, there's a microphone where people are sitting, uh, where the audience is staying, if there are enough flags, um, what's the time when it starts, who's asking the questions, uh, everything that has to do with events. And the last box would be a box that in Albania is not um, very common, but it's very important, which is the fundraising box. Is the person who would make sure that there are enough resources, financial resources, to support the campaign. Because in the end of the day, everything has a cost. You put a billboard, you pay for it. You pay for print, and you pay for rent. You put an ad, you pay the TV stations. So you need to get enough financial resources to be able to take the campaign till the end, because you might find yourself starting the campaign and, that, and then um, there's no, no place to go. But um, to cut this uh, short so that um, I'll come to an end and then if you have questions, um, you can ask them. Um, I think the most important thing for the campaign is the strategy. If you don't have a strategy, you would not have a campaign. The most important thing is the strategy. You need to have a strategy, you have to have an objective, and you have to have, uh, you need to have also means to reach that objective. You can have a very good strategy, but if you don't have the right objective, the campaign won't be good. Um, for instance, um, what is, uh, let's go to football, what is uh, Barcelona's objective? Uh, Barcelona's objective is not winning the, the, the championship in Spain. Most probably, they would do it. Their objectives, objective would be the Champions League. Now, based on the objective that you have, you need to have the right strategy. Because if your objective is to win the, 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 the King's League, whatever that's called, then your strategy is to you know, um, have all the players play all the time in the National League. But if your objective is to win the Champions League, then the strategy changes. Because you say, look, I need to have the main players and the best players be well rested so that they can play properly in the Champions League and not in the, in the National League. So it's always important to know what's your objective. And once you know the objective, you have to have the proper strategy to, to reach that objective. Yeah. There was a question. And It was, uh, I think it was a mixture. Um, a mixture, um, you know, uh, a lot of things uh, have also to do with, with who's your opponent. I mean, according to all our surveys um, and all our data, um, the last four years were sleepy, sleeping years, where you had a mayor who, um, Sorry? No, but we needed to choose somebody who would be um, opposite to what the last four years had been. So if, according to us, the mayor was sleeping, we needed to choose somebody who would be energetic. Um, if, uh, according to us, the, the mayor 
had not done anything, we needed to find somebody who had a clear record of things that he had done. And then, of course, uh, it's also important to have somebody who can have a good campaign. To us, um, the campaign in Tirana looked uh, pretty safe. Uh, so we wanted somebody who would mobilize uh, people uh, and be able to run a campaign without a lot of efforts and needs from the headquarters. So that the headquarters would focus a lot on other cities that needed more support. So based on uh, Arion's records of achievements as minister, based on um, our perception that he had enough energy, a young person who gets things done, and based on his ability to run a good and consistent campaign, it was the best choice for us. Obviously, it wasn't a, an easy choice. Uh, but. You know, the thing with Grida Duma uh, is, is, is different. Um, and I want to say this. It's, it's, really, it's really interesting. Um, right now, if you take a look at the polls in Duras, um, our candidate in Duras, over men, would win by a margin of 3 4%. So if you only take the, the male voters, uh, DACO would win by 4%. If you take the women voters, DACO would win by 20%. <laughs> now, usually you would say women would vote for women. But it's not the case with Grida Duma. Why? Because women are jealous of her. So, uh, I'm not sure that Grida would have been a good candidate in, in Tirana. Um, you know what happens uh, again, according, according, no, because this, this goes again to the, to the tribal thing. Take a look at the polls. If you take a look at the polls, um, the number, the percentage of people who vote for Halim Kosova is the same. It was the same when his name was introduced and it's the same today. He usually gets around 30%. Um, that's more or less the percentage that the Democratic Party gets in Tirana. Uh, yeah, of course, of course. Um, now, what happens, again, according to our polls, is that there's a big change in Halim Kosova's not vote, but favorables and unfavorables. When we ask questions in the polls, we don't only ask if you're going to vote for Arion or if you're going to go vote for Halim. But what we say is, do you have a favorable or unfavorable opinion for each of the leaders? What has happened is that in the beginning, all the people in Tirana, because it's a very tribal place, they would still vote for Arion and they would still vote for the left. They would have a positive opinion, a favorable opinion about Halim Kosova. Now, the numbers have not changed the votes. It's again, left voting for the left, right voting for the right. But now the percentage of people who think Kosova has a positive or favorable reputation has gone down. That's the difference of the campaign. So, not always you, you have um, a decision, uh, you, you always have a change in votes. But you might have a change in this, which is also important. So going back to, to Grida, I don't know. Uh, I think she would, most probably, she would also get the same percentage as, as Kosova when it comes to votes. But I believe Kosova was a good candidate because at least in the beginning, he had high positives, high favorables. Then, of course, depends on the campaign. In my opinion, he's not done a good campaign. People, by listening to him and by knowing him more, have gone, his favorables have gone down. But as a start point, although Grida and Halim, according to me, would have the same percentages in votes, Halim would be the best to have higher favorables uh, from the candidates of, of the Democratic Party.
In this so, who is who is uh, what is the process? It's it. that those two words come into the circle. We would usually have a brainstorming session. Uh, think about what our strategy would be. Think about what our message would be. Come up with a couple of slogans. Try and test it. The slogan does not need to be only good when you hear it or see it, but also when you use it. Our strategy before this was clear. I mean, what we were saying and what we are saying is that, look, uh, you can't pretend to solve everything in two years. It was really bad. It's not good. We've been trying hard. We've not accomplished everything. But are we going in the right direction? Of course we are. These are not general elections. This is not the time to tell us you promised this, you have delivered or not, because this will be asked after four years. But this time, what you can ask us is, are things going in the right direction or not? According to us, many more things need to be done, but things are generally going in the right direction. So this was a message, this was the strategy, and the right direction fits, fits well. And then we also found a song that was named The Right Direction. Um, that was more complicated. Yeah, that's totally Albanian brainstorming. Uh, but that was more complicated because I mean, 2013, according to me, were elections that cannot be repeated. I mean, if, if people pretend to have any time in the next 10 years results that would be close to 2013, it would be really hard. I mean, according to our polls, we haven't changed much. Usually a government, after being elected, has a six months honeymoon where the numbers still stay the same. As we're almost two years and the numbers are still keeping the same. Uh, partly because all of these things that I told you that, that are highly support it. Partly also because of the opposition, I think. Yeah, I mean, I was reading today one of the papers and there was a, an interesting article about this whole, I mean, this whole uh, strategy of the opposition saying that these elections are a referendum on the, on the government. And by voting for us, you'll we will uh, uh, get the energy price down, decrease taxes. This is stupid. I mean, first of all, everything shows that it won't be a big win for the opposition. Maybe it won't be a big win for us, but it won't be a big win for them. So if you say this will be a, a referendum on the government, and if nothing shows that you'll get a clear victory, it's a big risk because it's all about perception. Secondly, it's stupid to say that vote for us because we're going to decrease the taxes. I mean, I vote for you, I elect Grida Duma. Is she going to decrease taxes? Of course not, because she cannot. I wasn't staying in the US, I was, I was studying in Austria. Uh, but then I, I, I chose I <laughs> no, I chose to, to come back. I don't know. Uh, during the years that I lived in Austria, I always wanted to, to be in Tirana. Then when in Tirana, I always wanted to be in Austria. And I think there's this, it's always like this. You always want to be where you're not. Uh, but, but you know, Answering to your, to your question, I, I, I feel lucky because uh, I had the chance to finish my studies and start working immediately in the field that I studied. Um, 
to tell you the truth, I, I tried to do a master's in 2009. Uh, I had a scholarship uh, from uh, the British government, uh, went to Cardiff to have a master's in, in political communications, uh, stayed there a month, then came back uh, because, uh, you know, I was staying there listening uh, to a very nice professor who was explaining how to write a press release. Um, and, you know, uh, the experience that I was getting by, by staying here was much more than, than, and I think this was the reason why I, I decided to come back. I mean, if, when you have the chance to work so closely in the field that you studied, it's, it's hard to say no. Thank you very, very much.